Hey, good evening tonight. Let's uh, get started. Let's do some singing. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant, Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, a famine and darkness and sword, still like that song leader. Good evening. <laughs> Glad you're here tonight. It's good to see you. Welcome to our summer series that is almost over. It's hard to believe that summer is coming to an end. But we have more college students here. They're starting to come back. It's good to see you guys. It's good to see everyone here. If you're our guest tonight, we are glad you are here. If we were giving gold medals, you would all get a gold medal tonight, okay? Yes. Tonight we have uh, Garrett Marshall here with us to continue in our study of the names of God. Many of you know Garrett. He has his own fan club right over here. So, <laughs> some of them are related, and I don't think that's part of the fan club, but that's okay. Garrett preaches for the Dell City Church of Christ. Before that, he was at Westside and Norman as a youth minister. Got his degree, bachelor's degree from OC, and then went to law school at OU. Practiced law for a couple of years, and then in his own words, he mastered the laws of man and decided it was time to work on the laws of God. So he went into full-time ministry, and so that's what he's doing. He's serving Dell City Church of Christ. Uh, his wife, Paige Green, some of you know Paige. They have two children, Finn and Lincoln. Garrett has lots of energy. He was in our campus ministry, and I always remember when we had campus ministry-led services in here, Garrett was always the energetic one, so I suspect that will, that will continue tonight. But we are glad that you're here with us. We look forward to hearing the message God will bring to, or to us through you as we continue to think about who God is and what that means for our lives. We're glad everyone's here. Let's start with a prayer, and then we'll sing a little bit more. Father God, we thank you so much for the way that you bless us. We thank you for letting us be your children, calling us your children, adopting us as your children. God, tonight as we think about what it means to have you as our dwelling place, Father, we want to abide in you. We want to dwell with you. And we're so thankful that you choose to dwell in us and with us. Father, we want to be by your side. And we thank you that you have allowed Jesus to make that possible for us. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. 
Thank you for the forgiveness we have through Jesus. Father, tonight as we open up your word, we pray that you would bless our time together in scripture, that you would put something on our heart that would make a difference in our lives, Father. Be with Garrett as he speaks. We praise you and thank you for Jesus, and in his name we pray, amen. Sure do like that welcome guy. <laughs> uh, if you would, please be standing for these next two songs. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find.
Like I need one, but good evening, everyone. I am so excited to be here. I've been looking forward to this gig all summer. I, as Randy had mentioned, I was here all through my undergrad, and so some of you might remember me, but now look, I'm, I'm all grown up, uh, figuratively speaking, of course, <laughs> but... Uh, but I am, that is why I'm excited to be here. It's kind of like coming home. Uh, I love this congregation very, very much, and so I'm super excited to speak to you all, not only because I have a lot of family here, um, the last name Batchelder, Marshall, if you know those guys, those are my kin, and so be nice to me if you like them. This evening, I really, really like the series that you guys are doing. I really like the study of the names of God. And while I really like it because as a preacher, one of my flaws really shines through in my ministry, and that is that I am like really, really terrible with names. And so usually I will give nicknames to people to help try to remember them. Uh, one of my proudest ones is there is a minister in our office. His name is Ivan, and I call him our evangelist. <laughs> okay, you guys don't think that's as funny as I do. That's all right. I have had several nicknames myself, uh, the ever-popular Gare Bear, uh, but also one that is very rarely used, only by one of the ladies sitting over there, Carly, um, is Gert the Dirt. So if you thought your nickname was bad, no, you got nothing on me. And I like nicknames, and they help me remember things about that person because they usually capture an aspect of their identity. And so it should be no surprise that God in the Bible has a lot of names. And as you have learned throughout the summer, no doubt, each one of his names kind of captures an essence or a characteristic of him. And I'm really excited because we get to talk about ma'on or dwelling place. And to get our minds working into what this might mean, our dwelling place, I want you to think of where you call home. Where would you say is your 
home. And for some of you, this is going to be quite literal. For some of you, you're going to say, um, well, uh, 1300 Maple Syrup Avenue is my home. That's where I live. That is where I call my home. But for some of you, that is not the case. Perhaps some of you are like me and my family. In the past 12 years, I have had 10 different addresses. And so the place we are living in right now, we have been there for just over a year. So that means, of course, that it's probably time to move. So if you see any good deals, uh, let me know. But for some of you, that might be the case. Maybe the place that you physically live is not really a place that you would call home. And maybe it's for even different reasons than you move around a lot. Maybe your home is not really, well, maybe your house is not really your home. Maybe your home is full of chaos. Maybe it's full of conflict. Yes, I am insinuating that some of you have teenagers in your home. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> so, sometimes your home is not where you would call where you feel happiest, where you can relax, where you can unwind. Maybe that's your hometown. Maybe you like to go there to feel really at home. Maybe it's, for some of you, nature. Maybe you go on a hike and feel like, ah, yes, this is home. This is where I feel most comfortable. And why I want you to think about that is because I want you to think about what characteristics though that place has for you. For myself, that place has stability. It has structure. It has a place where I know what is going on. It's a place where I feel secure, valued. That is where my home is. That is where my dwelling place is. And what's fascinating about this name of God is that it is mentioned specifically in Psalm 90. And that is where we're going to be tonight. So Psalm 90 reads this way. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So something really interesting about this psalm is this psalm was actually written by Moses. Which is interesting to me because whenever you think of Psalm, you probably don't think of Moses. When you think of the Psalms, who do you think of? David, King David, that's right. But Psalm 90 is written by Moses, which has a lot of implications that I would like to at least take a look at tonight. The first one is that if it was written by Moses, this means that this Psalm is really, really old. It is probably at least 450 years before King David. And so knowing that this psalm is probably one of, if not the oldest psalm we have in the Bible, it means that the Israelites knew this psalm. They carried around this psalm. Almost certainly they had it memorized and they knew it. It's kind of like our Amazing Grace. Okay, Amazing Grace is only 250 years old. So does everyone know Amazing Grace, I'm guessing? Okay, so that, this psalm would be like their Amazing Grace. It would have that kind of power and knowledge for them. The second thing I want us to notice is that this was, once again, written by Moses, which means that we should look a little bit at the author to see how he, why he might describe God as his dwelling place. I think it's fascinating that Moses, of all people, would describe God as his dwelling place because if we look at the life of Moses, he really never had a physical home here on earth. Just a quick synopsis of Moses. Remember Moses, the, the circumstances of Moses' birth. 
Pharaoh has sent out an edict saying that all Israelite boys should be killed. And so his mom puts him in a basket and sends him down the river. And he is picked up by none other than Pharaoh's daughter. And so scholars are going to say that for the first 40 years of Moses' life, He lived in a household that was actively suppressing and abusing his people and family. He knew he was a Hebrew. He knew he was out of place. So for the first 40 years of his life, I think he would have real problems saying that Egypt, the household that he was in, was his home. Can you imagine that conflict there? That mind tension of living in the house that is oppressing your family and your people. But that's not all. Through a series of rash decisions, Moses then has to flee whatever he would have called Egypt and goes to the land of Midian. So once again, he is now a foreigner in a land. This is where he decides to have a family But it's still like if one of us, you know, I'm not quite 40 yet, but um, I'm 30. And so if I were to move to a foreign country, I don't think I would ever think that country was my home. This place would always be my home. And so even though he lived in Midian and raised his family there for a while, I still highly doubt that he would say Midian was my dwelling place. And then God comes to him through the burning bush, leads Israelites, the great Exodus story that we all know and love. And then through another series of rash decisions by him and his people, now he has to wander 40 years in the desert. Again, Moses is found without a home, without a place that he could say, this is where I feel comfortable. This is my dwelling place. And so is it any wonder that Moses writes Psalm 90 and says, you know what? You know who's really my dwelling place? God. I think that's fascinating because he never had a real home on earth. And so it's pretty easy to make the connection that he would find his dwelling place in God. In fact, he knew this on a very, very intimate level. Remember, he gets to go up to Mount Sinai. He gets to spend time in the very presence of God, so much so that he gets to see his back and glows for like 40 days after. That's how close Moses was in a partnership with God. And so once again, it's no wonder that he says, God is our dwelling place because Moses lived it. He knew where his true dwelling place was. And I go through all of this to ask the simple question of us all, where do you dwell? Where is your happy place? I would love to tell you that when I am stressed, when I am anxious, when I feel like I need to go to my dwelling place, I would love to tell you that I turn directly to God. I would even love to tell you that 50% of the time, I turn directly to God. But that would taste a lie. Because whenever I've had a hard day, When I am anxious about something or just tired out of my mind, you know what I do? I flip on the TV and turn to an episode of Friends, objectively the greatest TV show that there ever has been. (laughs) All right, all right, all right. Some, Some conflict here, I love it. So I find my resting place in something different than God. I turn to the TV. Sometimes I turn on a video game because I like to live in a world that makes sense with rules that I can play around with. I like to get lost in the problems, not of my own, but of Ross and Rachel because it's hilarious and because I've seen it 4,000 times so I know what's going to happen. 
Maybe you're in the same boat. Maybe your happy place is in entertainment. And maybe it's not TV. Maybe it's not uh, video games. Maybe it's sports. Maybe when you're super angry, you've got to go on the driving range and take out your aggressions on a golf ball. Maybe it's the basketball court. Or maybe it's some other hobby that I'm missing. Or perhaps it's even your career. As funny as that sounds, maybe that's where you find your worth. That is your dwelling place. Or, here's an interesting thought. Some of us even would say our dwelling place is our friends, is our family. And I list all these things not to say that they are objectively bad. In fact, finding comfort in your friends and family is probably objectively good. But what starts to happen is instead of using all of these things, entertainment, sports, friends, family, career, as gifts from God that they are, instead we use them as crutches to get through the day. Instead, we use them as the only thing that is getting us out of bed and then into bed at night. And that's your dwelling place. I'll tell you, this is doubly goes for me, but you might be putting your dwelling place in the wrong place if I were to say to you, you need to get rid of all of your televisions in your house. All of them. Never watch TV again. And you would, I would freak out. Because I use that as a crutch, not as a good dwelling place. So, we've talked in a lot of platitudes here, and I don't like that. And so, we're going to continue on, because when we talk about where do you dwell? What does it look like to dwell with God? And the first thing that we need to notice is that all the characteristics that we listed in our head about where our happy place is, we need to start finding those things in God. Because as Moses will tell you, if you start putting your faith in things of the world or putting your dwelling place in things that are not God, he will tell you firsthand that those things can change. Those things can be taken away. You will always have that scared worry that whatever you lean on could be taken away. Even your friends and your family. I can tell you, my friends from 10 years ago are different than my friends now. Even families can change. And so God desperately wants to tell you that there is a place where there is consistency, stability, Something that can't be taken away from you. Put your dwelling place in God. Because he is the opposite of everything that the world can offer you. He is stable. He is where you find worth, value, love, security, consistency. I think John 14, 23 summarizes it pretty perfectly. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. Now, I really don't like sermons that like the main point is like, just follow the Bible, do what it says and you'll be fine. Which, it, that is true. That is true. Don't get me wrong. But this is one of those sermons that... The main crux of it is that if you are finding your dwelling place in God, you are going to be living it out with the words of Jesus. They say it pretty clearly here that those that follow the words will, God will dwell with them and him, it, you'll dwell with God. And if I think back into my own life, about when I have felt most separated from God, it has always been when I am not living my life in the correct way. 
I always feel separated from God when I know that I am not living the way he's called me to live. And this verse puts that in perspective and says, if you follow my words, they will come and make a home with you. Now, my, my next point is, is going to sound stupid, but, but bear with me, okay? If you dwell with God, where does that mean God dwells? I'll put it in a way that clicked in my head, and you're going to be like, wow, you're really dumb. But this is how it goes. If you live with your spouse, where does your spouse live? With you. Okay? So I know that doesn't sound like a super big revelation, but whenever you put it in the context of our relationship with God, it actually is pretty cool. Because if you dwell with God, that means God dwells with you. Do we have the next slide? Maybe? Okay, yes. So what's super interesting about that is that I love the way they organized the Psalms. Because Psalm 90 in the opening verses, talks about how God is our dwelling place. And then Psalm 91 immediately goes into, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And I love that last word there, trust. Because if you are going to find your dwelling place in God, that means that you need to trust that he says who he says he is. That you trust that what he says is true. That he is truly consistent. Truly can't be taken away. And what's interesting about that word ma'on is that it's translated dwelling place in Psalm 90, but can very easily be translated as refuge and fortress. Where do you go for protection is what Psalm 90 and Psalm 91 are asking. And Psalm 91 actually goes into a huge swath of blessings that people can find when they are finding their dwelling place with God, which leads me to the point that I was trying to make earlier, that whenever you dwell with God, he dwells with you. And this is a theme found throughout Scripture. First, God dwelled in the tabernacle. Everyone remember what the tabernacle is? We're going to go back to Moses. Moses comes down from the mountain, and they build a tent, a portable house of God with very many specifications, and God moves with his people through the tabernacle. And then, whenever the nation of Israel finds a more permanent dwelling, they build a temple. And then God dwells in that temple. But what's super interesting is that after the temple period, there is a question among the Israelites whenever northern Israel is conquered by Assyria and whenever Judah is conquered by Babylon, the question becomes, where is God? Where did God go? And to find the answer, you actually have to look in the oft-avoided book of Ezekiel. Okay, if you've ever given Ezekiel a good read, you will be melting your brain because it's really, really difficult. But it's full of all this prophetic language and all these prophetic visions. And what I love about it is that one of those visions, Ezekiel sees God and his angels as wheels and eyes and wings and all the points of the compass. And all of that is to send the message to Ezekiel and thus to the Israelite people that God goes with you. God traveled with you. Even whenever you went into exile, God does not abandon his people. He moved with you. With tabernacle or temple or not, he moved with you. And I 
go all of that to say that throughout scripture, the message that God is trying to tell you is that the creator of the universe, the master of the cosmos, wants to live with you. And I think that's pretty cool. The best way I could describe it is if the king of England came to your door and said, I know I have a mansion with servants and a lot of cash, but instead I am going to live with you, Garrett, in your three-bedroom, two-and-a-half-bath house. And where you move, I will move. I want to live with you. I want to dwell with you. And God is so much cooler than the king of England. I'm sure he's a nice guy, but God is way better. And he wants to dwell with you. We've been talking a lot about individualistic, and I want to look at the words of Psalm 90 very carefully, because Moses said, God is our dwelling place. Which is interesting, because I think that might offend our Western sensibilities a little bit, because if a Western Christian were writing that, they would almost certainly say, God is my dwelling place. But Moses doesn't use that language. He says, God is our dwelling place. And I make that point because I think we as a Western Christian society have really individualized faith. And while there is an individualistic component to it, for sure, the Bible talks about the people of faith in this grand narrative, a story that we as a people are continuing on. We are part of the same story that Moses is a part of, that Adam is a part of, that Jesus is a part of. And we are all together. God is our dwelling place. It's a communal effort. It's a communal blessing. Do we think about dwelling with God in those terms? Do we think about dwelling with God, finding our refuge with God as a community, as a people, rather than just me? Now, to be sure, there is an individualistic component to it. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it's not on the board. Uh, It says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple for the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. So God does dwell with us individualistically, but he also dwells with us as a commuting community. It is this really cool reciprocal partnership that God invites us all into where he wants to be a partner with you and you and us together to bring kingdom to earth. It's so cool. I love this name of God. And it was really hard to pin down one direction that you could go with this particular name because it has so much in it. It has a lot of facets to it. I would encourage you to continue your study in the name of God as your dwelling place and what that all means for you and for your community specifically. But I know I've thrown a lot at you, and so I want to make sure you come away with what I want you to come away with. So I have done big takeaway one and big takeaway two for your convenience. First, God is where you want to dwell. As we have talked about repeatedly throughout the night, That if you are finding your happy place and your dwelling in things that can be found on this earth, then you are never going to be satisfied with where you dwell. Your job can be taken away. Your wealth can be lost. Your family and friends can go away. Your physical home can be taken away from you. But God can never be taken away. He can never be changed. He will never not love you. He will never not be there for you. 
Can you imagine not dwelling with God after all of that? It's an invitation for all of us. And we can't ignore it. Second big takeaway I want you to get is for God to dwell in you, you must know his son. And I know we only kind of briefly touched on this, so I want to add just one more verse to make these perfectly clear. One last slide. 1 John 4, 13 says, By this we know that we are able, uh, that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father was sent, has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know that to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God. And God abides in him. If you don't have that verse highlighted in your Bibles, I would. Because it sums up exactly what we need to have to abide in God and him in us. And that is to know his son and to put love in the forefront of our lives. That's what it means to dwell with God. And so tonight, if I had a challenge for you, I would want you to analyze where you're at in this mission. Do you feel that you have a dwelling place with God? Not just in the future, not just in eternity, but here, right now, on this earth. Do you feel that you are dwelling with God in a meaningful way? Or do you find your source of comfort and security from something else? And how are you doing with becoming closer to God? Are you following his words in order to become closer with him? Are you trying to mimic his son in the best way you can so that you can truly dwell with them? That's the challenge I have for you tonight. I've really enjoyed our time together. And hey, you get a, little, a couple extra minutes to your night, so can't complain. All right, let us go ahead and end with a prayer for this evening. God, we love you, and we thank you so much for this time that we have together, that we can come as a community of believers and take some time out of our day to focus on your word to learn more about you, to know your names more fully so we can fully grasp your character and who you are and why you are such a worthy God to serve. We ask that you continue to lead our lives in a place where we can dwell with you more fully. We ask that you help us to forget our crutches and our leanings that are found in this world and instead find our dwelling with you. We ask that you continue to bless our lives and help us to more fully imitate your son, not only so that we can have a hope of eternity with you, but also so that we can feel close to you right here on this earth right now. I ask that you bless the Edmund congregation and all the great works that they do. And in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much, Garrett. I, uh, in the Olympics, you know, I don't know if you've been watching, but they sometimes put the heart monitor on the parents of the athlete in the, in the stands, and they, they show on the screen what their heart rate is. I wish we had one of those on Garrett when he's up here speaking, just to see what the number might be. I don't know through the roof. <laughs> Appreciate your message, and thanks for reminding us who God is, that we dwell with him and he dwells with us. Next Wednesday, we will conclude our summer series with a special time of praise and worship around some of these themes we've been talking about all summer, who God is, and the names of God, and the power of God, and the everlasting nature of God, and the love of God, and that God is a shepherd, and so many other things about God. Jason will lead us, and so you'll want to be here next Wednesday night for that time of praise and worship. 
Again, we're so glad you're here tonight. We do have a cookie fellowship out in the quad. Everyone's invited to that. I will say, I think the youth group's about to come in. There's a baptism tonight in the youth group, a young man named Cameron. And so I would just ask, if you want to stay in here and witness that, that would be great. But you might just sort of find a seat here after they come in. It'll take them a few minutes to get ready. Or if, uh, if you want to go ahead and go to the cookie fellowship, that's fine too. But just want to make you aware that the youth group will be coming over in just a minute for this baptism. And so do whatever you need to do. Again, glad you're here. You are dismissed.